Hi, and welcome to the Citizen Jane Film Festival Film School. Um, we're going to be talking about collaboration, which was something I was particularly excited to talk about because I have some thoughts about it, and I'm hoping that all of you do too. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to introduce everybody first, and then we'll get a chance to look at some of your work. And what I'd like to do is ask you some questions about collaboration and how well it worked. I'd love to hear how well it did not work and why um, you think maybe it, it hasn't worked or things you've learned about collaborating with each other and with, with people. Um, so I'm Paula Elias and I'm the Citizen Jane Film Festival director. And sitting next to me is Katie Inn from Tiny Circus. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, and Sally Beauvais from Tiny Circus as well. Hello. Hello. And then Mel Eslin yep. from Improvement Hello. Club. And Dana Hansen from Improvement Club. Mari Ulrich from Faster. And Yvonne Welbin from The New Black. And many other things. So thank you guys all for being here. I really appreciate it. And we're going to have some interesting conversation. Um, we'll actually have time for a Q&A at the end as well. So we'll make sure that if you guys are thinking of questions, I'd like you to think of them now so that you're ready to, to jump up. And when you do ask a question, please uh, grab the microphone, uh, because then people will be able to hear you and your brilliance. Um, OK, so um, what I'd like to do, actually, is to start by showing a clip. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about that. And then you can also segue into other projects you've worked with. and and just give us some of your insights on collaboration. So if we could show the Tiny Circus clip. A creative act is one in which uh, you uh, take a chance. What was the last thing I made? My headbands. Turkey burgers. A cut off t shirt. A birthday card for a friend. I fixed a bike, but that doesn't really count. So I guess that's the last thing I made. I mean, if that counts. I used to make rolls and cream puffs. I used to like um, markers. I used to crochet, I used to embroidery. I used to knit. Last thing I can remember was doing crochet, which I used to do like middle school maybe. I think middle school. Well, I haven't made anything recently. I think it's more just a question of time. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot more other demands on your time right now. Making something can take like hours, even if it's very little. The closest I came to being creative was when I was an athlete, running the ball in football. I want to consider myself a creative person, but I would hesitate to call myself a creative person to anyone else. I wouldn't say like, yeah, I'm creative, like if I'm like writing down adjectives that describe myself. Um, but then again, like I do enjoy like, I dance, and I enjoy making dances, and actually, now that I think about it, the um, last thing I made was a dance. Everybody has creativity. A lot of creativity does come into stuff you have to do. It's hard to say why or what it is that sets something off. And you can be creative in different ways, like in different ways of solving a problem. I'm, I'm satisfied with what I've created when I feel like it solves the problem. It can be part of anything you do. Because what you make is your creation. A creative act is one in which uh, you've got a problem or you've got something to cope with. It's not something that requires talent. Take a chance. I love that you guys are here on this panel because to me, when I think of Tiny Circus, I think of collaboration. I mean, that's, it's the part and parcel and it's almost in your, your cellular level. You know, it's, it's something that you guys live and breathe. And so I'm, I'm really excited to hear what you guys have to say about that. If you could describe a little bit of the process of Tiny Circus, I think that would be good because it's all about collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Um, 
Tiny Circus, to give a bit of background, is a, an organization that does stop motion animations. Um, it's an organization that does stop motion animations, but does them with emphasis on collaboration as part of the process. And so um, collaboration involves uh, working together to solve problems at all steps of the process and also focusing on um, taking a non-hierarchical approach to those, those problem solving issues. If you want to fill in, okay. yeah. Um, See, they're collaborating right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're always collaborating. Yeah, I think um, the process of making our films is just as important as the, as the result. You know, the success of the film. Um, and what Katie said is true. I think collaboration is important because it's sort of it offers an alternative to this patriarchy that we were talking about at the summit yesterday. It's a, it's an alternative process. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a complicated process with the groups of people we work with. We have um, we have summer sessions in which we sort of um, that's sort of our experimentation, um, an opportunity for experimentation with our process. We meet for a, a month um, with a group of collaborators. Some have never never animated before. Some have been doing it for a couple years, um, and. In that situation, there, with that range of experience, I think that's where um, there is like a, an, an opportunity for hierarchy to sneak in. You know, you have like people who have who have done this for much longer than other people. Um, but we're always working to close that gap, just in terms of teaching everyone the technology. Um, you know, Julia was saying at the summit yesterday um, that it's really important to kind of take the time to teach someone something, even if one person in the group can edit in a half hour and the other person, it's gonna take them like three days um, to learn this editing process. It's really important to take that time in order for everyone to understand kind of every step of the process. Um, yeah, so. And the, the um, clip we just watched is, from, <coughs> is an animation called Creativity that uh, was completed during a summer session um, in 2012 and was um, created by anywhere from 15 to 20 people over, over the course of three weeks. And so those 15 people, um, which fluctuated at certain points, um, <coughs> did the brainstorming together, did the storyboarding together, did all of the sort of logistics, planning out how that um, kaleidoscope image would actually function. There was a, a large chart involved and a lot of um, drawings on the floor. Um, there, was, there were testing periods where we went out and picked objects from around the house to, um, to bring together and, and try out, do these pills work better here or do the, the coins work better or should we use mason jars for this, um, for this scene? And then the, all of the shooting happened together, which is, um, documented in the in the film itself through that time lapse um, those time lapse sequences mm -hmm. um, and what's really wonderful about that is that we're doing that whole process of making the film but we're also having these conversations um, at sort of a, a zoomed out level of what of what we're doing together so those conversations um, about collaboration itself and about the process itself are just as instrumental to um, <clears throat> to creating something together um, as the final product. Those conversations involve um, what's group temperature right now? Are we feeling that we need to spend time working on more brainstorming or should we move on to this next thing? Um, or how do we feel about, um, are you, do you feel like you're talking enough and, and contributing enough or do we need to sort of figure something out where more people get to um, have their voices heard, and so. So, what do you do in that situation? You see the temperature. You know, how is everyone feeling? And one person says, "I really think we need to brainstorm more." And everybody else thinks, "Is it majority rules, or what do you do?" It's sort of majority rules. We have a few kind of like um, rules that we've, yeah, we've got <laughs> sayings and rules that we've come across as the group has developed. Um, we have this thing called the wave moment, where you have the responsibility to recognize that if you're pretty much the only person in the room, that feels like. Um, you don't agree with the decision that's being made, but everyone else is rolling with it and you're going to be sort of like a stick in the wheel. Um, it's your responsibility to say, okay, this is a collaborative process. You, it's a, you have to let the wave crash over you and say, all right, I'm going to roll with this and like, compromise what I'm thinking. Um, 
So it is, I suppose, a, a majority rules um, situation. You said something about hierarchy that I thought was interesting. Um, do you feel that that is the antithesis to collaboration? In a way, yeah. I, um, yeah, because hierarchy, within hierarchy, you have kind of divisions of people and people at the top, their opinions are most powerful or most important. Um, and although it's painstaking and kind of time consuming to, um, to check everyone's temperature and kind of like move people into this space where they can all critically agree on something, um, you know, within reason, I think it's probably the most important thing about moving forward as a group. Um, yeah, we have other rules as, um, for sort of like how the group operates when we're brainstorming. Um, one of them being you think about how many people are in the room and this is just kind of like a self-checking rule. Um, if there are five people in a discussion, you should be talking about 20% of the time. And mm -hmm. if you're talking more or less than that amount, there needs to be like a pretty good reason for that. And it doesn't always work because people have naturally dominant and less dominant personalities, but it's a really good thing to remind people to, to keep in mind while they're participating in group work. Um, and sometimes we've used hand signals in the past where say there are two people in the room um, who seem to be carrying out a point back and forth and they're sort of losing the rest of the group. I think that's how a lot of decisions can be made under the guise of collaboration when there's a, gr a room full of people, but there's really only two people dominating, which is sort of a hierarchy situation. Um, yeah, you so don't know what's going on. you don't know what's going on, put your thumb on your forehead. And then one person does it, and all of a sudden the rest of the room is doing it, and you realize, like, okay, we need to zoom out for a second. Um, so sometimes we'll have, say, like a, moder a, a rotating um, role of moderator in the group, and it will be their job to say, you know, okay, it, they'll be in charge of zooming back out and reorienting the group towards the point at hand. Um, so, and those nonverbal sort of signs, um, like letting the wave wash over you or, or not knowing what's going on, or we even have sparkle fingers, <laughs> which is like, I, I can get on board with that, I agree, um, <laughs> is a way of uh, addressing addressing sort of agreeing or disagreeing or um, communicating with each other um, at this level that's not as charged as it can sometimes be, where it's hard to say, you guys are just talking and I don't know what's going on, which sort of becomes personal in a group setting, um, to sort of normalize this, this style of communicating that's, that's very important when trying to solve problems together. I love kind of the silliness of the physical movements mm -hmm. because I think it can get heavy. It's hard to collaborate. I mean, it, it is. It's it's hard to to respect everyone else's opinion and to you know let it let it go to do the wave. And, and this is great. Is it this or? Yeah, this, I think it's, it's kind this. of an upside down. Yeah. Um, I, and I love that because I think it, it adds some lightness to yeah. what otherwise can can get a little heavy. You need that because it does yeah. get charged and right. people have their feelings hurt. But we're always kind of trying to push away from that feeling of making a group decision and letting less of your personal opinion or like preference enter, you know, you're thinking about what decision is best for the group rather than what decision is best for yourself. And so do you find that um, you really, like if you, if you weigh the decisions that one person would make or if, you know, the hierarchy was allowed to rule versus groupthink, do you find that those decisions tend to be more quality decisions? In groupthink situations. Mm -hmm. It takes such a different form from um, a hierarchical situation in which one person makes all the decisions. It, it happens slowly and it happens in this way that requires a lot of um, coming together and thinking and then sort of breaking out of these sessions in a completely different place than you were when you started um, conversing with each other about an idea. Um, but I think that ultimately, I, th I think the word, the buzzword floating around in, in work situations um, collaborative work situations right now is synergy, um, which is just, I guess, the idea. I didn't really know what this meant until I looked it up recently, but that the idea that um, uh, the, a bunch of parts coming together create this sum that's, that's better than, I don't know, the, the, the sum is greater than each of the parts alone or, or yeah. put together. And so, um, the, yeah, there are really interesting things that happen when when there's this sort of flattening of, of the, the playing field or, or the conversational field um, that takes the group in and, and excels the group to a different position completely. That's, yeah, that might be... Um, Do yeah. you find you guys work with a lot of different groups around the country? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, they travel around and kind of teach people this process. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so much more than just stop motion. Right. I mean, though yeah. I think that's an interesting phrase. It's like stop motion. You know, really is kind of the process. Yeah. So um, do you get feedback from groups that you've changed the way that they deal hmm. in the future? Yeah. Um, well, the summer session seems to be a really intensive, immersive experience for people um, because we all live in a house together. So there's as much as we collaborate on working on animations, we collaborate on who is doing dishes and who cooks dinner that night, and we all clean in the house every morning at 9 a.m. Um, or 8.30. Yeah, that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Drink coffee before that. But, uh, but even when we are traveling and doing workshops, I think that it is, um, it is a valuable thing. We just um, finished up a workshop at Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa, and worked with four students full-time. They're on the block system, so... Um, each cl they have one class at a time for a month, and we it was it was fairly yeah. intense. We um, saw them all, more than ten hours a day, um, <laughs> five days a week, and so being in that situation and having to figure out together how we're going to come come out of it with three or four new animations, um, it became everyone's everyone's problem to solve in a way, um, and there was really. A difference in the way that people approached work um, and approached uh, relating to one another um, by the end of it that was I think I think really important and the feed the feedback that we got was was fairly positive um, yeah there are frustrations always you know in here especially in a, a week-long workshop where there are so many kind of like conversational and, and cooperative um, hurdles to get over um, but I think more often than not, the result at the end of that week is, is satisfaction, especially at watching this thing that, this, this movie that you under, you kind of understand every facet of it, you know, from, from the initial brainstorm of the topic to, to like how this little piece of paper is like moving by degrees to the right and then to the left, you know, you're able to identify like where you are actually moving things on the animating table um, to the editing process to collecting sound. Um, yeah, I think that satisfaction lends itself to kind of like reflecting positively upon the experience of, of collaborating. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is, is very empowering. I think that's the word that I would use to characterize a lot of people's experience with, with Tiny Circus and with this, I, I guess, not only with Tiny Circus, but with the process of collaborating is that you feel empowered to do work that you wouldn't normally think of yourself as able to do. Again, the whole is bigger and right. more powerful than the yeah. individual parts. Yeah. What's fascinating, I mean, I, think I could talk to you guys all day about collaboration. <laughs> you guys have figured some things out about it. Um, I'd love to move on uh, to Matt Lislin and Dana Hansen. Um, and if we could show their clip from the Improvement Club, I believe. Um, and then we'll get a chance to talk about it afterwards. <clears throat> Be thinking of some good stories about collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You guys, that was definitely a collaborative effort. <laughs> yeah, that's. I've I've been just reflecting in the last ten minutes or so <laughs> about um, how immersed I feel in the collaborative process and how and how many different forms that takes. Like it's very interesting 
to listen to, to your approach to collaboration and to think about how chaotic my own is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, and one of the things that's nice about, about this clip is that it, 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 it's kind of a little snapshot, I think, it, of, of some of the ways um, that collaboration was in pl at play in the creating of Improvement Club and, you know, and then even in, in the way that clip looks. Uh, <clears throat> I feel like the, um, you know, just even the choreography right there, and there's a lot of dance in Improvement Club, that's my background is um, choreography and live dance theater work. Um, but uh, in, in, in Improvement Club was made very quickly on a tiny budget, um, my first feature film. And um, I remember the day when I told, I asked my collaborators, my, you know, same as my cast, um, you know, to create, like, here are two steps. Like, can you just go over here and, and make something that would work really well going down an alleyway or going down a street, going down a sidewalk? And so they just went to town with a little with a little seed um, that all I did was provide that and then absolutely trust that you know what they were going to come up with in that situation was going to work well. Um, and and one of the things that instantly happens then is there's an ownership, there's a kind of yes. you know collective um, shared ownership of of the of the work itself. Um, it, you know, another thing that I see when I look at that is, um, you know, a, t a tiny idea that I had that I shared <coughs> with my editor, um, who I worked very, very closely with, Sean Donovan, throughout the whole, you know, post process, and, and you know, again, like, here's a seed, it's in my head here. I'm not capable on my own, it's just beyond my skill set to, to realize this fully, and to, and to, you know, and to, again, like um, give over the the kernel of an idea to someone else, and then and then watch what they do with it is is something um, that for me is very exciting and um, uh, takes me to the to the point that I've always felt very strongly about in collaboration is that when you're working, whether it's with a group of people or one other person in a collaborative way, what what I find happens and what really thrills me about that process is that you end up almost inevitably going to a place that you were not able to imagine yourself. Um, it's not to say that kind of soul authorship isn't equally exquisite and powerful, um, but, but for me that thrill of like, oh, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't quite see it going in this direction and this is so wonderful, is that, that's, that's always something that really drives me. And then our our sort of relationship on this film is really interesting. Yeah. So I think, but I think we, you know, we both anyway. Yeah. It. I mean, <laughs> well, this film is is such this layered um, collaboration. That's. I think it's kind of perfect for this because it started out as a performance piece that Dana had done Improvement Club and traveled with these actors in the film, um, and then also has a band, so that's Dana's music that's playing, that they're dancing to. So, so many people in the film, they, they danced, they acted, they played the music, they composed for us, so, um, but what's amazing with this, so Dana had the performance and then she wrote this script, and, and I got the script at one point um, as, uh, you know, I think you reached out to me to produce or do something with it, and I was on another film at the time, so I was like, I can't be a part of this process. So they went and they shot the film with a lot of our other collaborators, and then I, you know, I ended up coming in. Suddenly, I became available, and you know, was like, well, what state is the film at? And at that point, you were just kind of getting into the edit, and so then my collaboration was all in post, and you know, I kind of got this amazing opportunity to sit in and go, okay, you know, there was a group that collaborated on the film, and now we're going to come and we're going to do this post, and we had this amazing. Uh, editor and we brought in a composer and you know we had a lot of the actors come in and compose different like a tango for mm -hmm. certain scenes mm -hmm. and just really kept ch like going through this circle of different people who were collaborating at, at, at different times so it's so funny because there's people in this film that I've I never personally had a collaboration with but I know my parts of the collaboration and you know it's been, you know, we've all kind of taken our turn a little bit with the film, yeah. but with Dana kind of running through the whole the whole thing, and it's it's just it's been a really amazing process for me because um, I'm 
I'm a little bit more used to the formal filmmaking process, and for me, this was just an amazing eye-open experience. And just hearing about how you guys collaborate, it's just it excites me to think how can we keep integrating that into the more formal structure of a film, you know, a film set and a film production. So I think this is a great yeah. example. The yeah. thing that is keeps coming to my mind when you're talking is um, trust, mm -hmm. because it would require really an immense amount of trust on everybody's part to provide something and then have somebody else be working with it here, or to give somebody a seed and let them go off. And I think that's absolutely true. How do you create that? Well, um, the you know the ensemble that I had that I worked with the the, the performers um, are all you know multidisciplinary artists that I have a tremendous amount of respect for, and some of them I've worked with for twenty years. Others, you know, this was the first time. And um, but but the fact that when we began to shoot Improvement Club, we'd already been on an odyssey together, an artistic odyssey that involved various levels of of collaboration. My bandmates um, were were involved in that performance as well, and so we, you know, the band kind of predated that whole. Um, so I think time was really important, um, and time and shared experience, and and actually being able to endure some really rocky moments. Um, that were part and parcel of, of the, both the creative process and then the process of you know the production of this piece and the kind of like what are you know what's the trajectory here in terms of the you know the touring that we're going to go on together and and you know we had an age range of like 19 to 55 or something like that with you know just everything in between and and 10 people and I, I think it was just a messy very um, familial um, environment and and experience that <laughs> you know, people were ready to wring each other's necks at various points. Sure, you know for sure. Right. But um, but I think that that I think I think being able to endure those rocky moments and the tension and and kind of navigate through. I love these ideas yeah. for like kind of you know like. Just kind of accepting that this is part of the process, and here are some tools for it. Yeah. I didn't have very good tools, but we somehow made it through. But I think that um, I think that 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 is a huge part of of the trust, and then I think it, that grows. That it just builds on itself when then people see like, oh, I I I made this part of it, or 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 the thing where you can't even remember. Mm -hmm. Who actually kind of had the idea, or created this, or made up this, or you know mm -hmm. contributed? Because it is fluid, and and that kind of, it's it's also very it feels it can feel very intimate in that way when it I mean you can't even kind of pick out who who's responsible for what. But right. I think trust is incredibly incredibly important. And also letting go of ego and ownership. It sounds yeah, like yeah 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 absolutely right, right. yeah. Tell, tell me about um, the crew that you worked with. I mean, obviously, you two are women. Um, yeah. Did you notice any difference um, working, because obviously you had men working on the project as well. Yeah. Did you notice any difference where we come from? Well, <laughs> this is an interesting yeah, question. Yeah, we, and we both live and work primarily in Seattle, and I would say there is a huge uh, female filmmaker base there, but it's... I don't know, and it's funny because a lot of the men we work with, we call them women too, I think, because everybody's <laughs> just, you know, it's, um, there, there's, I don't know, it, it's, yeah, the, yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's, it's very fem, feminine, yeah, the, the, the community there is kind of very, right. what do you mean by that? Let's go ahead and describe that. Okay. It, you know, there's, um, I don't know, there's something, the, the care, I think that you would, ex the, the motherly care, it, it comes from the men and the women in our community, and we have such a collaborative nature. And you know, our, our DP Ben Kazelki, I've been working with for I think seven years. You've been working with him for ten, 10 years, yeah, yeah, ten, twelve years. Um, and it's just this. There's this great base of filmmakers who, you know, this person may be a DP, or you know, in, in my regard, I would call myself a director before a producer. But we all kind of we shift our positions you know for whatever project is happening so you know we had D, you know our DP Ben who's also a director or a writer or an editor and um, we had an amazing uh, sound mixers and just mm -hmm. different people coming in and and that's just what happens in Seattle it's I've never experienced it anywhere else but it's um, it's more of a community creating films and you know it's interesting though because our creative creative process we always do have 
one person I'd say who's you know the vision it's their vision um, so there is kind of that the, yeah. I wouldn't want to use the word leader but somebody who has the vision and then everybody kind of you know falls in line and then is trusted to go off and take on yeah. And yeah. see to that kind of clear vision. It's yeah. I think there is hierarchy in 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 that community, and certainly in in you know in the process of creating improvement club, but but in you know in that case too, I was definitely leading the process, and felt very closely supported by Ben. And and I've had many experiences with Ben in the past where. You know, like oh, we're gonna work on a short film together. He's lining up the crew. He's handpicking people who, like, I, he's used the word like, I'm trying to avoid dudes. Like, I'm trying to get the right, you know, like, because a lot of the shooters, a lot of the sound people, are male, and but he's like trying to choose the. He's trying to create a chemistry on set. Yeah, but it doesn't mean males. He's just like there's men. a dude. Yeah, there's he a dude. A, mentality. Yeah, he's like he would <laughs> always make sure that there were no like. There wasn't this like doodly type yeah. of presence, on, which yeah. sounds really sexist yeah. and awful. But I, 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 knew, I, I knew what he meant. Yeah, we yeah, have, exactly. And, Let's talk about what yeah. he meant. I mean, yeah. I think it's it's okay. We we aren't ever gonna get through these issues unless we're willing to name yeah. them yeah. and really talk about what our experience is. And it doesn't have to be everybody's experience. Yeah. But, yeah. So yeah. what does it mean, doodly? Well, I I think that it, it, it it's a kind of sexism that um, that he, that at least he was taking great care to 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 just kind of make sure that that element wasn't present. Um, what does it look like? Well, he, I see I've been very well protected from that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awesome, by the way. Um, I mean, we have, we, a lot of us in Seattle, we call it Crewtopia, which is something that we're constantly striving to create on every one of our projects, which is everybody's in it for the same reason. Everybody at Day's End can hug and go out for a beer, and there is, it's, you're there to make the film. You're not there for a paycheck, or you're, you know, you're there. We we want to work with our friends. We want to work with artists that we love and we support. I think it's a support system essentially. Yeah. I mean, if you're not going to be helping to add to that support system, then we don't want, you know, we don't need any attitudes or, yeah, I no, love that no dicks. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah the, the sense of a shared investment and also that that people I think have caught on in Seattle to. This reality that if I if I'm if I'm involved in a project and I give it my best and I and I have this like heightened sensitivity because that's what I see um, is is a lot of of a really good solid presence on set and and attention and and sensitivity <laughs> that then that comes back to whoever that person is and so you see people a lot of young people coming up. In, in that community and and more and more opportunities coming to them maybe because of the way that they're they're learning to interact with you know with artists and and designers and technicians on set well I guess that's a good definition a lack of sensitivity is are the dudes maybe, yeah, yeah maybe yeah. <laughs> just un unable to read those moments right. you know and right. those subtleties on the set and yeah. right and, and I think it should be noted that it doesn't it doesn't come from a place I think of malice no. It comes from a place of this has worked for me before, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to continue to try to do this. And I'm not yeah. aware that, that this is <coughs> problematic or right. you know, um, right? Well, and we don't get taught to collaborate, right? I mean, we really don't. Not in American society. It's not something that's um, that's taught or even highly valued in a lot right. of situations. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marie. We're going to show your clip from Faster, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about it and get some thoughts. I'm hoping you're brewing some thoughts over there. <laughs> I know you are.
I apologize. I knew. I swore I would not do that. Mari. Sorry. Right. I did it anyway. I'm sorry. So, um, yeah. So, <laughs> tell us about it and tell us your thoughts. Um, hmm. Well, this is a narrative short, and it was created in more of the formal, hierarchical kind of um, system with a larger crew. Um, but I would say I'm always looking for that collaboration with, especially with a DP who you have sort of a mind meld with, and um, even the producer, you know, who can help with casting, and um, especially with the actors and um, we did a lot of research together uh, myself and the actors um, and I also uh, since this was a film about a community that I'm not part of I did research within the community of bike messengers and I found them very willing to help me and collaborate and I was a little intimidated because I felt like I was trying to infiltrate something and maybe they wouldn't welcome it or you know but they um, really came on board in many ways and I got references, you should talk to this person, you should talk to that person. Um, you know, they read my script and said, this is, you know, I've had friends who've told me this exact thing happened to them or, um, so especially with the actors, so there's um, uh, Chris Pomeroy who's playing the blind character and you know, we both were like, okay, I don't personally know anyone who's blind, so we need to research. And we went to um, the Lighthouse Institute and talked to people. We had lunch with people, just figuring out what do they use, what do they, you know, how do they handle currency, how do they work at a desk job, how do they, you know, all of this stuff, and then rehearsals and just working together. So I found it a really amazing process. Um, also, you'll notice there are a lot of action-y kind of traveling shots with her on the bike, and that's a kind of choreographed <laughs> uh, moving, you know, it was not a camera bike. She's on the bike, and we're in a car, and we had, um, so I had a bike messenger who was kind of running um, interference. running interference ahead of us. Um, and so, and we're all on walkies, so that was like kind of really amazing. Intense. Yeah, and intense. <laughs> um, it's weird that you can just get away with that in Chicago, <laughs> in the middle of whenever, um, <laughs> which we just recreated for my feature, you know, over shooting overnights and doing the same kind of thing. And, you know, sometimes I feel like maybe the, the police, Chicago police collaborated with us. Cause like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see ya. Um, I think you actually, you bring up something, at least this, I'm not sure if you were really saying this, but there's something, I think, very valuable about women working in a leadership position. Mm. Um, I think I would say that as women, we get taught to collaborate at an early age, and really collaboration is almost part of our survival. I think mm. men get encouraged to compete, mm -hmm. and this is just kind of the structure of our society. Um, so I think going against the grain and women being a leader and telling people what to do, I think it's a very empowering thing and I think it's very valuable to mm -hmm. get experience doing that. And so I'm, I, I'm actually not here to say that you only need to collaborate. I think uh, women naturally do that and I think walking outside your role can be very powerful. What, what mm -hmm. I mean, I was that? feeling a little guilty because, you know, I, I don't have like a co-director. I'm not like, you know, collaborating I'm to that extent. people what to do. Or, yeah, it was a really more you. hierarchical, but... <laughs> You know, I'm always looking for that person who's going to take that idea, take ownership of it, and bring themselves to it and create that moment that's better than what I had thought well, of. So. And how do you think, um, what are your thoughts at least on um, you being director, being in charge, telling people what to do, do you think you do it differently than maybe a stereotypical man might do it? <laughs> I don't I don't know. I mean, I've worked on a lot of crews with a lot of male directors, and they're all different. So and, what, and they're all they're different. all different. Mm -hmm. You know, all different styles. So you don't think it's really a gender thing? It's more a an individual personal thing. style. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I I would not maybe hold myself up as the you know the example of you know excellent leadership on set, but right. somehow it you know because as you can tell, sometimes I have hard times verbalizing things, even though I'm a writer. But I'll get on set and I'll just be like. <laughs> Nobody talked to me for a minute. 
But um, well, I think about what I want to say to the actor after, you know. But um, there's that. <laughs> um, but and another thing that came out of this was working with the crew. So working with uh, my director, Catherine Henderson. We after that shot a Chrome commercial for Chrome Messenger bags, and she produced my feature. Um, and the DP, Tony Santiago, I just brought him in to direct um, a short film that I made with um, GVSU for their summer film program. So, because I knew he was chill. Right, right, right. <laughs> And could handle, you know, go yeah. with the flow. So, and, I, and to, the, to the point of, I would love to find Crewtopia. <laughs> and to the point of, you know, it's not, I always tell my crew, I heard this on a reality set actually, but, wasn't that dude, it wasn't like no dudes on set, it's just no assholes in general. If I'm allowed to say that, like, I'm just like, I, we don't, it's stressful enough making films that, you know, to have to deal with people's, you know, everyone has egos, but to be able to not let it be personal if it's really just about working. Well, and together. film has to be a collaborative process. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just like putting on a film festival. You. You can't do it by yourself. If you, you think cannot, you can, yeah. you know, you're crazy. It's not going to happen. So yeah. I mean, you really do have to figure out how to collaborate, no matter what your personal style is. Mm -hmm. I think I'm finding too that I like working in a smaller, um, within a smaller set. So I'd rather have people who are more invested and a smaller crew, um, and just have more of that because the more people you have, the more people who are maybe standing around or you know just kind of like not contributing to the energy that you want. Right. And then it becomes more about, you know, managing some of that stuff. Right. Having interpersonal issues on the edges. Yeah, like, yeah. Like we're trying to shoot a film here. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Right, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yvonne, I would love to, I think you're, you've been sitting over there thinking of some things to say, so. I was trying to think watching your face. Say. Actually, what I was thinking was that I was wondering if people in the back can hear. Can you guys hear us? You can hear okay? Okay. Let's, so, do you want to talk before we show your clip? Yeah, I was okay. wondering about that. Like, isn't there a wandering mic somewhere that we could be using? Well, Should that's on. on. That's for just for the camera. Yeah, that's just No, we're okay. Okay. Um, Adrian, All right. Do you want to show your clip first or you want to? What clip are you showing? <laughs> trailer. The trailer for the new black? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, think, I, I think you just saw it, though. <laughs> Gay rights is it not about a gay right. Uh -huh. There's a difference between civil rights and sacred rights. Same-sex marriage is going to be put to vote here in Maryland. No same-sex marriage in the state of Maryland. Hop your horn, hop your horn if you believe. Many people in the state's religious community, especially in African-American churches, oppose gay marriage and are vowing to continue their fight against it. Thousands of Marylanders around the state want to see marriage defined and upheld between one man and one woman. One of the biggest donors is pushing a strategy to drive a wedge between gays and African Americans. All of a sudden, it was black versus gay. Our journey is not complete until our gay brothers and sisters are treated like anyone else under the law. Marquise had asked, when are you and mama getting married? Well, we're working on it, we're working on it. Regardless of what laws they may write, God designed the family. Who has been the hardest hit in the issue of family? The African American community. We were blasphemous enough to compare the gay movement with the movement for civil rights and black folks. Is gay the new black? I believe this election is going to be a referendum on the church. It's going to be a referendum on black preachers. If we don't reach out to these people, who's going to reach out to these people? Opposition. Remember both the question said. God do not make lesbians. He, he I certainly went, did not have the right you. degree to decide. Yes, okay, you, but let me finish. You're right. Sexuality in the African American community is taboo. We don't discuss it in any form. I feel like I couldn't be myself because I thought that I would shame you. Okay, are you ready for the vote? Yeah. Okay, why? What's up? You, Let's be clear. This is the unfinished business of black people being free. We are the sheep of another fold. Then we must. 
I'm ready to win. I'm ready to make history. Okay, so um, a lot of my research shows that women don't collaborate and that one of the reasons that we don't have as many films and there aren't, you know, there's just not a lot of production on our part. So this is unusual, I think. It's because we don't have anyone supporting us. A lot of times we'll come up with an idea. I'm not sure how long you were working alone before you got your team together. So what happens a lot is we'll have an idea, we'll write, we'll be by ourselves. How many people know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You're, you're sitting by yourself, you're writing, you're writing, you go like, oh, you know, I've got to do this because nobody's going to help me, right? You, you've thought that. And um, so what happens is we as a society are losing out because you are not collaborating. You are not putting a team together. You are trying to do it by yourself, and it is not sustainable. A lot of times you'll make one film, and it took so much to get that film made, which you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but anyway, y'all know what I'm talking about. Anyway, it took so much that you can't, I mean, you'll try to do it again, but you're like, I have to do it another way and whatever. It's, it's hard. So one thing that happened to me <laughs> is when I went to film school, I went to an art school. I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and it was a top art school in the country at the time. It's like the Art Institute or Yale, you know, they go back and forth, switching positions. I was surrounded by brilliant people, incredible artists, who have no business sense at all. And so, and so it was, and I'm a little unusual as an artist because I had a business before I went to film school. And so I actually understood that you need some money, <laughs> you're gonna make a film, and you need to be able to hire some people, and whatever. So I made a little promise to myself that I was going to help artists realize their dreams. And I became a producer. And a friend of mine pulled me aside one day, and she goes, you know, you need to make films too. <laughs> um, I don't want you to, I, I don't want the world to not also see your visions also. So I became a director also, but also a producer. And so I've made about 20 films now, but more than half of them are I produced. So I worked with the team. So if you notice, it's a film by Yoruba Richin. So we were a team working with her to realize her vision, to get uh, her story, the story that she wanted to tell out into the world. I would have made a different film I'm sure you all saw Angela earlier. She would have made a different film. So we were able to work with her. Um, Yoruba approached me. I think she had raised about $15,000 and asked me to come on and produce. Um, and one of the things that filmmakers do when they're early on in their career is they try to find more seasoned people to work with them because uh, that can help well, it gives the funders confidence because they're like, well, you know, okay, so Yvonne's made 20 films, Yoruba's made one, <laughs> and our one, you know, kind of major film. She's made some other things too. But um, maybe this is going to help. So when I met her, she had done the whole kind of round of grants, and they'd only gotten that 15000 Within a year, we got over 250000 wow. And really, it really was... She had great stuff, but I knew what it was like to work with funders. I knew what funders were looking for. We started putting together what the funder was going to be comfortable with. So she had everything, and this is what's happening to you all. You know you have a good idea. You know you have everything, but maybe you don't have the language that the funders are going to believe in and give you the money. Mm -hmm. So um, it changes everything to, to build a team, to put a team together together. Uh, it makes more possible. And then the next thing, once we had that money, we could bring Angela Tucker on, who was on the last panel. Angela Tucker um, is what is probably, it, it, we don't use this term in, in documentary, we use it more in feature films. It's like a line producer. The line producer is concerned with every line on the budget. That's where the word comes from. 
So because she had produced so many films for another, uh, for Arts Engine, she knew everybody in the business. She knew everybody everywhere, and she could help us figure out some of these lines in the budget. In Yoruba, one of the uh, main things that happened with me being on and Angela being on as co-producer is that Yoruba could be an artist and a filmmaker and a director. And I'm going to tell you, she didn't like looking at that budget, so she didn't really have to. Um, the things that she didn't want to have to do, that have to be done, which is like, for instance, reporting back to all the funders, doing the reports, which are really, <laughs> y'all know that, all of that paperwork for $1,000, and you're like, you want me to spend how much time <laughs> yeah, exactly. for you to give me $1,000? Anyway, um, and you do the math, and you're like, this is really not even minimum wage when I break it down. But anyway, um, so anyway, Yoruba could focus on telling the story that she wanted to tell. And one of the things that happened when we were shooting this is that we, um, is Marilyn came up, and what black people were blamed for, um, marriage equality uh, um, for Proposition 8 failing in California. It wasn't really true, because black people in California are only 7% of the population. But in Maryland, it was going to make a difference what black people did on that election day, how we voted. And what we were able to do uh, was to actually document the whole process. So what we have now in this film is a documentation of what black people really did in Maryland around marriage equality as opposed to something that was put out that wasn't true, that became true because people said it was, even though it wasn't. Um, so I don't know, I'm kind of rambling at this point. So good. No, no, so good. <laughs> but, um, I love the idea, um, when you describe what women do, you're right. I mean, yeah, you're like, it's my <laughs> idea, I'm gonna keep working on this and I'm gonna put it in a drawer. How many people have stuff in their drawers or wherever on their hard drive somewhere where you know somebody should see that, but you're not sure how to get somebody to see it. And so it's sitting there, bare. So, okay, so maybe it's two things. I'll just throw these out here and I'd yeah. love to hear what everybody has to say. But um, one, that we do feel like we, no one else is really going to help us, so we just got to do it alone. Mm -hmm. There's that. And then there's also the lack of confidence the insecurity of being able to say, hey, I, I mean, we always talk That's about... That's huge, 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 huge. We always talk about how if you're looking for somebody to run camera and you ask a guy who's maybe run camera once, you know, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm your guy and you got to pay me twice, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. and then the woman who's actually run camera five or ten times will be like, well, I could sort of kind of maybe, I mean, I'd do my best, but maybe there's somebody better, you know, I mean, these are stereotypical <laughs> responses, but it's kind of true, they're stereotyped because it's kind of true. So... Do you think those are what's coming into play there, or kind of? I'd love to have. All I, of your I think you hit it. I think it's the self confidence, um, and it's crazy. Okay, so from my research, I look at black women filmmakers. Right, black women filmmakers are like way more educated. Most have like a bachelor's degree in film and a master's degree in film. I also have a PhD in film. <laughs> I also went to like the American Film Institute and did the directing workshop. I mean, you would not believe how educated black women are in terms of, I mean, we, we know our stuff, okay? Black men may have gone to junior college, probably didn't, um, may have a degree, uh, and they do very, very well in the industry. So there's something that's happening, and this is, I believe, media messages, society, I don't care what you want to do. You're basically told that you don't have it. And so I think there's something that has to happen, and I think it'll happen as we keep making work, and we need to write about the work, and we need to tweet about the work, and we need to do just kind of uh, change. I keep saying that what's happening in the media needs to be disrupted. We have to start putting alternative messages out into the media so that people can grow up with different ideas of what's possible for themselves to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's really going to take all of us. I mean, you can say my um, contribution like, um, is that I'm going to be a Twitter person, and I'm going to tweet reality versus what's, again, we've got six companies running media in the entire country right now, and they are setting an agenda about what, what what we know, what we understand, what we understand ourselves to be, what we understand the world to be, because they control the media. So you can say, I'm going to use Twitter to disrupt the narrative. Whatever you're going to use to disrupt the narrative, it's important that we start disrupting the narrative. 
And, and this is the thing, even if you're still insecure and not totally believing it for yourself, you have a friend that you totally believe in mm -hmm. and do it for her. I mean, if you can't really get there yet for yourself, do it for the person that you know needs that to happen for her. And then it'll happen for you too. And I, I think that's right on too, because yeah. I think it's true as women, we will go all the way to the wall for a friend. Oh my goodness. Whereas yeah. for ourselves, we won't fight at all. Yeah. I mean, not all the time, but yeah. I think that's, that's often really true. What are, what are some other thoughts? Yeah, I think when, when the support system is in place for, for women to be collaborat collaborators, um, at least in my experience with Tiny Circus, and these are broad generalizations, I realize, but, and there are always exceptions, you know, in both categories. Um, but in my experience with Tiny Circus, women have an easier time collaborating than the men who have been participating, you know, when, when that actual environment is there, which is a rare environment for sure. Um, you know, Tiny Circus is a female-dominated group for sure. Um, there have been some summer sessions where we've had like five men present. Um, and we've noticed um, what, there have always, there have been situations where it's just kind of like those five men are talking and having kind of a, an intense back and forth and the women in the group are sitting back and watching this unfold and um, we kind of have to stop and have a discussion about that happening, you know, and I don't, again, it's not coming from a place of malice, like you said, but I think it has to do with like a kind of socialization that happens for both genders men are socialized to be competitive and vocal and dominant and women to be agreeable and understanding. Um, and I think collaboration works better with the kind of agreeable and understanding mindset. Um, but there are problems with, with that as, I think there are problems with both kinds of so socialization. Um, mm -hmm. You know, having critical thoughts and knowing how to express those appropriately, that's a really valuable tool as well, where I think generally women are predisposed to maybe keep critical thoughts to themselves for the sake of, of letting a, a group discussion thrive or you know, um, prioritize, prioritizing empathy over expressing kind of a critical thought. Um, um, but I think that empathy is a really important tool for delivering criticism, kind of like understanding how to do that yeah. in a productive way. And I think maybe that's something that's generally <coughs> more natural to women, just the way that we are sort of like raised and socialized in the world. Well, even I always feel like when we have these discussions, we need to have a disclaimer that says there are exceptions to the rule. Yeah. You know, we're, oh, we're not, yeah. you know, we're being general. And, and that's all true. I think the other side of this is, you know, it, it's a little scary to say, yeah, women are socialized in this way or women are like this mm -hmm. because we're fighting for people not to think we're like this. We're fighting for the freedom to be exactly who we are individually. So I, I think that's, that's a challenge because on one side, we need to be able to talk about it. We need to be able to put it out there. Right. But on the other side, we don't want anybody to pigeonhole us because that's what, you know, so yeah. it's, it's very challenging. Yeah. Other thoughts? I, I just keep coming back to that maybe um, maybe there's some interesting models that are happening both organically and then uh, more formally in Seattle that that are interesting kind of case studies. I think Mel has already kind of described this community where really if you look at directors, like independent film directors in Seattle, most of them are women. And I think that's, and, and there is a fair amount of, of film production happening in Seattle. And that, that's, mm -hmm. that's an accurate statement, um, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's also um, these institutions. There's, a, there's an organization called Real Girls um, that, that, that exists to, to empower you know, teenage girls to make movies. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's really it's a successful organization that's been around for, I don't know, maybe, maybe almost 10 years. And there's a lot of momentum around it. And so you have these, you know, you have these, um, the kind of culture as it is at the moment being reinforced by, you know, some initiatives and, and um, you know, kind of more formalized programs that, that can also help disrupt the narrative and, and redefine, um, you know, possibility and, and kind of defy what, what the expectations are. And, then, yeah. and, it's, and, and, when, and when that community is, is successful, 
And then when there are films that that go out of Seattle or that that are you know that are, they are kind of um, get get more attention or you know if, then then I feel like that's. It, it, it's just, I think it's potentially very powerful, right. you know. Well, it definitely helps the cause, right? like, well, the, Yeah, there's this little, there's this little pocket. Right. Yeah. But it's interesting because I feel like I've, I've been in a bubble because I'm hearing yeah. everybody going, oh yeah, it is probably very difficult in other places. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's hard, you know. I think we forget maybe that we have maybe have it easy because that base and that, it's all about what you were saying, the support system, if that's set up. I mean, for me, I think that's the biggest thing. I think I've always, as a human being, just been a little gender blind I've, in general. I've never looked at somebody and thought male, female. So for me, it's always such an interesting topic to hear that and go, oh, wait, that there is, you know, people do face that, and you do have to overcome that. And I, and I, and I think it's great, you know, what you were saying about, um, for me, the biggest thing has been supporting other people has always ultimately been what's empowered me, especially as a producer. I've just, I have that, I never maybe want to have kids, but I want to help everybody else make their babies and make their films. And, um, and for me, that's kind of pushing somebody else forward has really been what's helped me go, okay, I can do that myself too. Um, so I absolutely think it's just all about that give and take relationship in the collaboration process. Oh, and and even just in that example, like the how I I was I was the you know person writing alone. Oh, you know, goodness. even though I had a lot of collaborators, and then all of a sudden when Mel kind of came onto the scene for me, everything changed. The mm -hmm. whole world changed for me because because I you know it was just like in just in a in a moment, my outlook right. was was utterly. I'd like to ask Yvonne one more question, and then if you guys have questions, we'll, we'll open it up. Um, how, what you describe mm -hmm. with the new black is, mm -hmm. I mean, it just makes me, it almost makes me cry. It's we like, were so happy. We mm -hmm. loved it's the whole thing. experience. Yeah, so it's great. How do you have that? How, do you, how did Yoruba make that happen? Did she just start reaching out? Like, how does that, how do you get out of the room alone? Um, it takes courage because <laughs> I'm going to, she made a film before called Promised Land. You know, one of those regular, oh, it took me 10 years to get my first film. You know that story. I don't think it was 10 years, but it was maybe five to seven. It was a long time. And she didn't want to have that happen again, but she wanted to have a career as a filmmaker. And um, so she, you know, <laughs> okay, I'm really a hard producer, but my films do really well. Like once you, you work with me, <laughs> You're gonna win some awards and do well, okay? <laughs> but I'm I'm hard, so she's she sent me her her. Uh, I said, well, send me what you're sending out now. I'll take a look at it. And then I said, do you really want some feedback? Because some people say, yeah, I really want feedback, but they don't really want feedback. Right. What they really want is for you to say, oh, this is fantastic. Right. I said, well, and I said to her before I gave her the feedback, I said, what are your goals? <laughs> because depending on what your goals are. You may need to do this much work, or you may need to do this much work. Right. Okay, Yoruba want, wanted a career. She needed to do this much work. So we went through, and it was a very, very difficult conversation. And then I didn't hear from her for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then she called me back. And then we started working together. And then, um, and then you got to build the team. So we were looking for like somebody fantastic, which ended up being Angela Tucker to come on to the team, but you've got to build a team and you have to have the courage. Okay, so all filmmakers have to have huge egos or you're not gonna make it. Okay, and that's actually most <laughs> successful people, right? You have to have a really big ego, but your ego has to be extremely brilliant and smart. And what I mean by that is your ego has to be able to hear everything around. So, you, you, so to get out of that, you have to have courage you have to have an ego, that's a smart ego, and then you have to believe in yourself. So even though I might come in with feedback or Angela might come in with feedback for, the, for Yoruba, it's really Yoruba's film. So she has to be able to sift through all of that and figure out what ultimately is the story she wants to tell, right? So it take, I think it's courage, yeah. courage. Get the heck out there, right. Yeah, just, and, and, and it's gonna be okay. You're going to get, and, and, and be okay that you are going to get a little bruised along the way, but you are going to be so delighted and happy with the outcome. Yoruba 
has been traveling with the film. It's been overwhelming for her. She cannot believe the response that the film is getting. But she went, she went through it. Yeah. She did it. You know, so I think that's that's it. Yeah. Like, just just follow that Nike thing. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody have any questions? And if you do, make sure and get the mic. I know you're sitting there thinking stuff. There's a hand in the back. see hands. Mm -hmm. Vaguely. I have a question for the tiny circus ladies. Um, I know that you said that you actually live together. And I was just wondering if that was something that was something necessary for the way that you work or if it was just a choice you made. Yeah, the living together happens primarily during the summer sessions. Um, we're actually thinking about incorporating a, a winter session into the program. Um, and then we have sort of a, a fall tour and a spring tour lined up where we're traveling. Um, but the summer session it takes place in a, in a house in Grinnell, um, and it's anywhere from three to six weeks of living together with the people that you're working with. Um, so that involves living together, working together, and playing together. Um, and that, I think, is, is an intentional choice for um, that particular format of getting work done, um, which is to... It's this great experiment in co communal living, um, and it's also, I think, instrument. I think a lot of the, the, the word that I would use to describe it is, is immersion or, or an intense experience because to um, sort of generate this group think and this um, really fully throwing oneself behind the group project uh, requires a lot of time spent together and requires um, sort of the intensive experience of uh, waking up each day together and being on the same page with, with that alone. We're, we're tired because we all spent last night at the bar in town, but we're going to wake up at 9 <laughs> and clean anyway and shake off, right. the, shake off whatever <laughs> sleepies we have um, and let's equal. sit down and talk for three hours about stuff and, and get that all done. And so that, that going through that roller coaster together is important. Um, it doesn't happen with every, every tiny circus project. Uh, at the workshop we did last month, we go home, or we go back to where we're staying at night and then meet with the students the next day, or the collaborators, our collaborators the next day. Um, so there's a, var a variation in, in how much exposure we have, but the summer session living together is, is Pretty uh, all-inclusive time just time spent together. Yeah. You have yeah, I don't think add? I have anything to add. That's <laughs> it's much more intensive, and it's definitely an intentional choice in terms of the summer and potentially winter workshops. And dance parties. And dance parties. Yeah, so the socializing. Is very you need important. to plan to be at the party Saturday night because yeah. Tiny Circus will be there and they are <laughs> dancing people. Uh, other questions. You to all of you talked about support and a support system. What would you advise? Like, how do you get out of the room by yourself and find your people? How did you find your people? And what would you advise all of us to find people? And is there a process to making sure they're the right people? Good question. I, I met Yoruba at a film festival. Yep. Hint, hint. Yep. <laughs> yeah. She talked to me at a film festival. We're sitting at a festival. And she's like, hey, we should have dinner. We're having dinner. She's like, hey, we should work together. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> Let's talk about it. But yeah, film festivals are a great way to meet your team because they're already self-selected. They've already come here to the festival. They already have a huge interest in film. And um, sometimes it's not who you think it is. So there could be, I was talking to somebody earlier, I was uh, somewhere and a guy who worked at IBM had some money, which, you know, <laughs> it's always welcome. So. Um, <laughs> So sometimes the person in the audience is just somebody who loves film and wants to be there. That money can allow you to get the film team, you know, hire that key personnel person that's going to help you get your film. So I recommend going to film festivals. Mm -hmm. Everybody else does other festivals. festivals. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's what's so great about this festival. I've loved it so far. It's my first time here. But, um, I mean, the best collaborators I've met have been, like, we're at a 
festival and there's a ginormous dance party and they had the best moves and then (laughs) they start talking or you know I've gotten like snowed into a cabin at a festival and everybody is you know who you're snowed in with that night suddenly a year later we're all making a movie together and we've never met before so I festivals are just I cannot speak more I mean they're amazing so I went so I took um faster to the BFI it was at the London Film Festival and I had such an amazing experience like being picked up at the airport and here's your bag of chocolates and your pass and everything (laughs) so when I got back to Chicago a friend asked me if I would volunteer they were like oh you have a car can you pick up some festival guests from for a much smaller festival at the airport and I said yes that was such an amazing experience to be picked up at the airport and you know treated like I was somebody I'm gonna do that and I ended up meeting one of the people I picked up a lot of people. One of the people I picked up, um, he had a film in the festival, but his day job is he's a DP. And we were just kind of talking. And by the time he left the festival, he's like, when are we making your movie? (laughs) That's awesome. And so I was literally that person in the room, like, I am so depressed. This is never happening. (laughs) I don't even know why I bother, you know, and I would call him and be like, everything sucks. And he's like, nope, we're making your movie, you know, so. (laughs) Finding your team. I would say in addition to festivals, workshops also. That's how I ended up meeting the Tiny Circus crew, was actually taking a Tiny Circus workshop a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I guess most of the workshops I've taken have been in different media than film, but I would assume that there are a wide variety Mm -hmm. of of film workshops out there in the world. (laughs) And then join the organizations in your, Mm -hmm. wherever you live. You live here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm not sure what the organizations are here. What are they that you should join? We need to start one. We already decided yesterday, Julia said, we need to start a salon. So I think it's in Yeah, so that. join that. Be one, of the, be one of the founding members. <laughs> yeah, Andrea. Sure. That, yeah. Other questions? Um, all right, well, I think Yvonne already touched on this a lot, but um, I kind of asked this because I think um, some of the people here who are most interested um, in this whole process are, are students, and I wasn't a student too long ago, but um, it's not just because I'm a woman. I remember group work was one of the most dreadful sounding ideas to me. I think waterboarding sounded way more fun than group work. <laughs> and um, so I, I really think like even in college it's not as emphasized that much. So. Um, for any of you who are now like in these like collaborative utopias or you know <laughs> living living the dream of being able to work together, um, did you used to hate it as much as I did? Were there any like aha moments that uh, changed things Great for question. you? Yeah. Sometimes I still <laughs> I don't want to say hate, but I still dread some parts of that, um, knowing that there's a really really long conversation ahead about something that maybe. So sometimes we split off. We'll spend a lot of time talking about the the concept and enough so that we trust each other to go off and, and sort of complete a, a part of that. So whether it's doing a, a test of a certain material and how that looks on, on the camera or um, editing sound for a while or, or something, um, then we come back together and we discuss those that that work that's been done and it's really hard to put work six hours of work or or three hours of work or or whatever put that under the lens of the group and allow that to um be able to go in any direction that's that's a really challenging thing to do to detach yourself enough from it um from that work to say okay i'm going to trust the group with this again um and that part i think is sometimes dreadful and sometimes painful but uh after doing that really frequently, doing that a lot and a lot, it's, and, and seeing other people do that to the same extent that, that I'm doing that or that Sally's doing that, it, it, it becomes a little easier to make it out the other end of that conversation and then have something else to work on. And, and doing that a bunch of times makes it into, um, you were saying, we don't remember whose idea that was or who even um, suggested that one thing, but that it becomes something that's much richer and, and more vibrant than what I could have done alone, I think. Absolutely, yeah. Like developing those tools to make group work um, less frustrating, I think, has been the thing that makes me want to stick 
with group work because it becomes this really rewarding thing. Like there are so many frustrations, but learning how to deal with them. Like personally, I definitely experienced what you experienced in school. I hated group work initially. Um, and I studied writing in school. Um, and so a lot of my later school work was solitary. Um, and then kind of coming back around to Tiny Circus and working with a group again was a, like a tremendous relief from just work, the same thing, work, writing in my room by myself and like, you know, maybe giving that to like my group workshop and class once a week. Just like being the, the richness and like the breadth of ideas that are present when you have a room full of people. It was just a huge load off and like a huge reward to work with a group again. So I would recommend that <coughs> you change. <laughs> and, and only, 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 because, only because ultimately you're making your work for an audience. It's not just for you. So sometimes, and again, use the smart ego, participate, take what you need to take, leave the rest there, be gracious, and, and call you, I, yeah, change. I want to shift, thank, shift a little bit. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for speaking your minds. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank Tech TV as well as Stephen College, and thank all of you for being here.